And I have an adult son who has Down syndrome. He does not have regression, however. And i um, very happy to have everybody here today. So I'm going to give a an overview of Down syndrome regression disorder, the workup, and the possible treatment. And then we're so lucky today to have Dr. Wong and Dr. Parikh from the Cleveland Clinic here to give us a little bit of their insight from their um, clinical knowledge and be and we I see we have a several other doctors on the call too that I'm so excited about and we'll be able to um, have some general discussions. We can't give any medical advice for specific people, but we um, can serve as a source of information. So I'm going to begin sharing my screen. So this is just a little housekeeping at the beginning, just a disclaimer that says by viewing or participating in this webinar or watching it on the web, that you agree that the Down Syndrome Association or employees, anybody associated with us are not acting as a medical professional for you or an attorney. And um, that does not create a doctor patient relationship with anybody. And that information received from anybody associated with Desanio is not medical advice or legal and advice and that Desanio does not give any medical or legal advice that you would need to consult uh, your own person's physician or oh, lawyer for type now. of advice. If everybody can mute just um, until we get to the this, to the discussion part and then as people have questions, then we can unmute then. Okay, so regression is a loss of skills and it can happen at various times in the life of a person with Down syndrome. And there are many causes, medical, psychosocial causes that have to be explored. At certain times of life, a diagnosis might occur to a physician who's seeing a person with Down syndrome. In a very young child, one thing people think of is autism. In a child or young adult, it could be Down syndrome regression disorder or DSRD. And in a person aged 40 or older, then Alzheimer's disease, is, we begin to consider that. Tonight, we're gonna to focus on Down syndrome regression disorder. So this is an acute onset of neurologic or psychiatric symptoms in a healthy person with Down syndrome. And usually the timeline is weeks to months of, of a rather abrupt onset of changes. And as opposed to Alzheimer's, which is like more of a slow deterioration of, of abilities. And this has been around, I've been a doctor for about 30 years and I've been in the Down syndrome community because of my son. So you, we would hear cases and it would be called like Down syndrome disintegration disorder or obsessional slowness disorder. So this idea of this entity has been around for about 20 years, but it's only been in the last couple of years that the experts have agreed on a name and a workup for when these um, types of situations present. Usually the person is between 30, 10 and 30 years old, but it can occur at younger ages. And we think of DSRD when no other cause can be found after an extensive medical evaluation. Fix my screen. So the symptoms can include altered mental status or behavior, such as a change in appetite or eating very slowly, like taking an hour to finish a meal. There can be confusion or lack of awareness of where you are, and there can be inappropriate emotions, such as inappropriate laughter or crying. There can be signs of cognitive decline, like a lack of interest in the world around you or difficulty starting or finishing activities or memory problems. Developmental regression that can include social withdrawal, wanting to stay in your room all the time. I know a lot of people with Down syndrome want to stay in their room, but like not wanting to come out at all. Or loss of skills or milestones 
that a person has previously accomplished. People who used to be able to take their shower, get dressed, brush their teeth, get ready in the morning that can't do their daily living skills anymore or have or need a lot of help where they didn't before. Repetitive hand or body movements that are called stereotypy that are unusual. Difficulty changing routines. And again, I know a lot of people with Down syndrome have difficulty changing routines, but this is to the point that you can't get through your daily activities or the person won't leave their house and decreased eye contact can also be a sign. There can be a new onset of seizures or neurologic problems, and there can be a big change in sleep, like changing their sleep pattern, like staying up all night and sleeping all day, or just not being able to get to sleep. There can be a loss of language skills. Some people decrease their speaking, we hear a lot about people whispering or people not talking at all. And this is in a person who usually used spoken language to communicate or a difficulty understanding words. There can be movement problems. This can be very striking like bradykinesia, which is freezing or slowness in the moving. Catatonia, which catatonia is complicated. I, until I really started learning about DSRD, I don't think I really understood what it was, but it's really a lack of reaction to their environment and sometimes getting stuck in a posture, like stuck with their arm up or stuck in the middle of going up the stairs. There can be grimacing or, or unusual facial um, expressions. And there can be like, it might be hard to move somebody's arm or leg that's kind of stuck. Um, Cataplexy can be sudden loss of muscle tone. So just like falling to the floor and then difficulty walking. Psychiatric symptoms can be a large part of this anxiety and depression, though not all causes of anxiety and depression are considered DSRD. A lot of people with Down syndrome just have anxiety or depression, but not DSRD. There can be hallucinations, which are seeing things or hearing things that are not there. There can be delusions, like believing things that are not true, that, um, you know, hearing that I've, I've read that sometimes people think their family members are not their family members anymore. There can just be some disordered thinking that the person really believes and it's hard to talk them out of. Obsessive compulsive tendencies. And again, a lot of people with Down syndrome or have these anyway, but this can this increases or becomes very dysfunctional. And then there can be aggression and agitation. So the diagnostic workup is extensive because we, um, we call DSRD a diagnosis of exclusion. And that means you've tried to rule out anything else that could be causing those symptoms. And we're especially looking for things that are fixable um, in this workup. So that's very important. You have to have the big workup. And it's important that a provider knowledgeable about Down syndrome and DSRD is involved in the evaluation. And this evaluation can involve many different specialties um, and can be different for each person. Often there's a developmental pediatrician, neurologist, um, immunologist, psychologist, psychiatrist. There can be, it's sometimes it's in different centers, a rheumatologist. So it can be quite a large team. So in terms of what is done for the workup, the information on the next few slides is um, in this paper by Jonathan Santoro. Jonathan Santoro has really done, is at the forefront of the research on Down syndrome um, regression disorder. He is um, specializes in neurology and immunology. So he's really been the one talking about is DSRD in some cases uh, an autoimmune encephalitis, like a, an immune problem affecting the nervous system. So he was the lead author on the assessment and diagnosis of Down syndrome regression disorder. And that I really encourage you to download this article throughout this 
workshop, um, there's QR codes. So if you just shine your cell phone camera at the QR code and touch the little yellow rectangle, it will take you to the paper or the resource um, that I'm mentioning. And I think it's very helpful to actually read these papers and take them to your person's um, providers to see if, because not your, your general internist, family practitioner, provider probably doesn't know anything about this. So the diagnostic workup um, would include imaging, which is specifically a brain MRI because you wanna make sure if there's anything else going on in the brain, such as um, any like a stroke or hydrocephalus or a, or a structural problem in the brain, but also some of the new information is there's some, they're finding some signals on the brain MRIs that tend to occur in um, people with DSRD. So that can be a helpful signal also. An EEG is done to make sure the person is not having a seizure. There are many blood tests. A lot of these are to look for signs of inflammation or problems with the immune system. They look for antibodies against the thyroid system or um, if it also celiac serology, and then any, the cell-based autoimmune encephalitis panel, that's a big word, but it's looking for different antibodies that the body might be making against itself. An autoantibody is when the body makes an antibody against itself, and then it starts causing symptoms because of the inflammation it's causing. A lumbar puncture or spinal tap is part of the workup. And that again is to look for signs of inflammation or immune problems. I watched a webinar a week or two ago by Dr. Santoro and he did say this is a really important part of the workup. Um, the closer to the onset of the symptoms, the more helpful the workup tends to be and the more successful the treatment can tend to be. So it is of some, time is of the essence as these changes start to try to get the thorough workup done. There are other, a large list of other things that can be done commonly, um, a sleep study for obstructive sleep apnea, hearing evaluation and vision evaluation. And aside from DSRD, these are all important things for all people with Down syndrome because they are so common in people with Down syndrome and they can affect the functioning. So the treatment will really depend on what's found during the evaluation. We're looking for something that's fixable. And then if no cause is found, the diagnosis of DSRD can be considered. So this article reviews the treatments that have been tried for DSRD. Again, um, Dr. Santoro and then several other doctors from Boston and Pittsburgh have updated the therapeutic advances and that's available at that QR code. So traditionally DSRD or what used to be called obsessional slowness or disintegration disorder was thought to be a psychiatric condition. It was thought to occur like after a, tr a psychiatric trauma or when the siblings left home or maybe around puberty. And that um, I, that still probably is the cause in some cases. Dr. Santoro does think that different patients probably have different root causes of their DSRD and it's not all exactly the same diagnosis. So traditionally, the, some of the first medicines tried were psychiatric meds, like antidepressants, um, benzodiazepines like Ativan, or antipsychotics. Electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, has been tried for, for a long time. And in this procedure, the person gets general anesthesia, and then a small electric current is passed through the brain and triggers a seizure intentionally. And nobody really knows exactly what happens, but it seems to change the brain chemistry and can reverse 
some symptoms of um, certain mental health conditions. And it has been used and used successfully in DSRD before. For more information on that, you can go to this QR code. And this is specifically about ECT, not in relation to DSRD, but just so you know what it is. So as I said, in the, in the recent years, it, there has been a suggestion that perhaps some cases of DSRD are an autoimmune encephalitis. And encephalitis is like a, an inflammation of the nervous system tissue. And autoimmune just means the body is kind of attacking itself. So different types of immune therapy have been tried. So IVIG is intravenous immunoglobulin. And this is antibodies collected from blood donors and given as an IV infusion. So that's been tried. JAK inhibitors, JANACE kinase inhibitors, these are a different form of immunotherapy. And there's um, several brands that can be taken orally. Zeljans, you might see the commercials at nighttime, that is one of the big names in um, JAK inhibitors. And then steroids like prednisone or things like that. So currently, there is a study comparing the treatments that have been tried so far for DSRD. And this is being done by Dr. Santoro um, and Espinoza and Sanar. It's from Children's Hospital of Los Angeles and then Global Down Syndrome Foundation in Denver and um, Denver Children's Hospital. So it is comparing Ativan, which is a, the benzodiazepine, to IVIG, to a JAK inhibitor, tofacitinib, or Zeljans. And they, um, they are still recruiting for this study. So if anybody is interested, then you can go to this QR code and learn more about this study. Um, they, ha they have recruited quite a few people, but they do want more. Dr. Santoro did publish some information. There was a study that came out. It was a case report, not exactly from this study, but from a different study that was done on alopecia areata, which is when people lose um, bald patches on their hair. And it does happen in people with Down syndrome. And these people were treated with um, the, Zel, the Zelgians. And they found a lot of hair regrowth but incidentally, some of the people had DSRD and they saw a big improvement in their symptoms. So that was a case, those was a three case study that was just reported. The other thing from the latest um, that I hadn't heard of before that Dr. Santoro said in the last webinar that was just a week or two ago, and you can find the link to that on the NDSS website, is um, that a lot of the patients they see with DSRD presented with very bad dandruff, thickening of the skin on the scalp, and actually darkening and thickening of skin on the neck or hands. So the skin changes can also go along with the clinical picture of DSRD. So that's, um, that's the review, but I want to tell you about some resources. So Down Syndrome Medical Group USA is a group of experts on Down syndrome throughout the country, doctors, nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists, all kinds of um, psychologists. And they have a good sheet on regression that can be found at this QR code. Down Syndrome Resource Foundation is out of Canada and they have a podcast called the Low Down Podcast. And they have a very good um, episode on um, Down syndrome regression disorder. Dr. Santoro and Dr. Eileen Quinn, who's an, a widely regarded expert on DSRD out of Toledo, are both featured in that episode. And all their episodes are great. So check that out. Dr. Quinn also runs a Facebook group for families who have a loved one who is going through regression. And also she allows medical professionals who or other professionals to join. So that this is a really helpful group because parents post a lot of resources on there and there, there is a document that outlines 
all the providers in different parts of the United States who will treat people with DSRD or evaluate people with DSRD. And a couple of the parents who post a lot are actually doctors and that can be very helpful, but just hearing everybody's lived experience um, and also just being included in a community, it's a really great website. Facebook group, sorry. And then locally, we're so lucky to have Dr. Wong and Dr. Parikh at the Cleveland Clinic Down Syndrome Clinic. Um, uh, other local, not local, other nearby Down Syndrome Clinics, uh, um, Pittsburgh, Dr. Kushira Velodi, and Cincinnati Children's. And then Columbus has a Down Syndrome Clinic. And then another specialist in the Cleveland area who's not pediatric, who is an adult, psychiatrist who specializes in seeing patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities is Dr. Tom Scheidemantel from University Hospitals of Cleveland. He's at a conference tonight, or um, I did invite him to be here, but he's out of town, so he couldn't be with us tonight. So, and then Debbie and I are always available for any questions if, um, and again, we can't give any medical advice, but we can help point you to resources. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. And um, Dr. Wong, if you wanna, are you share some of your um, insight and experience with DSRD? Um, yeah, I think that I can maybe talk about the few kits that we have seen from the Down syndrome clinic. Actually, is um, Sumit here yet? Yeah, I, I am here a couple already before the kid even saw me, but um, there that would go come through the Down syndrome clinic. And I can think of a young kid who was, she was four and prior to the diagnosis, she had very good language skills and would be able to sing nursery rhymes and is very active. But over the course of about three months, she became basically like a nonverbal kid with um, autism. The interesting part is I had seen her when she was not sick. I think it was around October of that year. And then by December, what happened was she had a few back-to-back -back illnesses. I think one of them was hand, foot and mouth disease, but she also got a few other infections right after that. So one after another. And initially, when the mom noticed that she wasn't talking as much, her mouth was hurting her. So she was just thinking, okay, maybe this kid is sick and the mouth hurts. But after the few illnesses, this kid never um, regained her speech. So the first person who actually alerted me to this was her speech therapist. And it was her speech therapist who had known her since she was very young. And the kid went from being quite verbal and able to express herself and sing nursery rhymes and finish the rest of a poem to um, becoming pretty much catatonic, rocking back and forth and not um, communicating. She lost her um, eye contact and she became more like a kid that we would see who has autism. And when um, the speech therapist contacted me, I talked to the mom and because of her young age at the time, I still felt like it might be a possibility that it was one of these kids who has Down syndrome and then had a regression from autism. But the very unusual thing is this kid's language skills was so good and her behavior um, regression was so dramatic um, I had sent her to see Dr. Parikh. And so, um, Dr. Parikh, are you here now? Do you want to take it from there? No? Wait, I can't hear you, Laura. Could you unmute, Dr. Parikh? Um, yep, there you go. Now, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Hi, hi everyone. I'm, I'm Sumit Parikh. I'm one of the pediatric neurologist at Cleveland Clinic. I specialize in seeing children and adults with genetic conditions. Um, I've uh, 
been here uh, at Cleveland Clinic for about 20 years. And um, and I, I have the privilege of working with Dr. Wong um, and seeing and sharing um, some of these uh, children and, and adults who might have Down syndrome or who do have Down syndrome. Um, and, and I appreciate being invited today. Um, I think the child that Dr. Wong is speaking about is a bit of a unique case um, only because you know, as you've already learned and you might have already known that most of these individuals who have this happen are a bit older. Um, and it seems a lot more clear cut in how they were socializing and interacting and the kind of decline you can see um, being very dramatic. Um, and it's been amazing working with Dr. Santuro and being able to provide some sort of treatment to just be able to understand all of this a little bit better for the first time, um, when in the past, it was extremely sad and depressing to say, okay, this is happening, but we didn't know what to do. And um, the response, of course, the response has been really, really heartening um, and, and wonderful. So we really hope that, you know, we're glad this work is happening. We're glad that we get to collaborate with Dr. Santoro. And then at the same time, just just that it's making an impact um, for many of these young adults. Um, the case Dr. Wang was talking about is a bit unique because of the younger age. And I, we're always very cautious when we see young kids uh, going through this, um, but, as Dr. Wong kind of alluded, there were there was good video evidence of a level of social interaction and a level of engagement and language that had clearly uh, been lost. And not only were we seeing autistic symptoms, but we were seeing symptoms of catatonia um, on the videos as well as um, on our exam. And so we, at that point, uh, kind of chatted with Dr. Wong, talked with Dr. Santoro, and uh, went ahead and and treated this person. Were there other questions or thoughts that people? Do you want to talk about what kind of treatment and what the outcomes? Are? Yeah, yeah. So we we really just um, you know for anything that's this new, uh, developed as far as scientific development goes, we know that it's a bit of a moving target, and we um, really do lean on uh, some thought leaders, and in this case, it's Dr. Santoro and his group, and so um, we are following the protocols that they have. And these protocols have changed in just even a year and a half, and, and we kind of um, change with it. So everything that was outlined in the talk earlier today is done routinely. There is not the urgency as far as how sick somebody is that we need to admit them to the hospital, but unfortunately, just the way the medical system works, it is the fastest way to get all of this done quickly. So getting admitted to the hospital allows people to jump the line and get sedated MRIs and spinal taps and EEGs done much more quickly than if we try to schedule it as an outpatient. So the main reason to admit someone is not that we really don't have 10 or 15 days. It's just that we don't want to wait 10 or 15 days to try to coordinate all of this as an outpatient if we don't have to. So usually if somebody comes in we will confirm the diagnosis. We will set up an elective outpatient admission, or sorry, inpatient admission. And, um, and then we go through our steps. We, we really make sure we're not missing something else. Um, we, there are other kinds of immune mediated um, encephalopathies and encephalitides that we've learned about. Um, and we just actually had a case where somebody looked like they were having DSRD, but they ended up having a completely different type of autoimmune encephalitis. And um, it is treated in the beginning a little similarly, but then long-term it's treated differently. 
Um, and so we really kind of go through our steps, dot the I's, cross the T's, make sure we're not missing something and try to get some baseline information. And then after that, we follow Dr. Santoro's protocol, which for now is um, a slug of IVIG in the hospital. And then after that's given, we wait and see how the person responded. And then after that, if there was a response, um, we do anywhere from six to nine doses over the following six to nine months. So there's there's one dose given every month. And um, <clears throat> and then many people seem to really improve and then plateau with a return to baseline um, at least 90 to 95%, if not 100%. Um, in Dr. Santoro's group, there have been people who have not responded. We've been fortunate not to have that yet. Um, and, um, and, and then we'll see if his protocol changes, we'll change with it. About not being able to find doctors who will treat it. How did you first get interested in it or, you know, take it, take it on? So we're so thankful that we have resources in Cleveland like this. How did how did you get to be able to do this? So I my specialty area is helping with diagnostics for anybody who has an unknown genetic condition, or we use the word neurodegeneration. So pediatric or adult person who is declining and nobody knows why, and they've excluded the common things, um, they will usually end up in my clinic. And so from the Down syndrome side, you know, fortunately, the numbers are not very high uh, for this, which is, which is good. Um, but over the years, um, either through Dr. Wong or through uh, other referral sources, we've had pediatric patients with and without Down syndrome come in with catatonia. And they get evaluated by the neurology team. They'll get evaluated by the psychiatry team. Um, and we have our protocols for individuals who do not have Down syndrome. We will then, um, if we strike out, quickly go to genetic testing and they'll loop me in. And so you see it, do you, have you treated any adults with DSRD or? Um, we have seen adults with DSRD, but not in the last year and a half since all this started up. Okay. Yeah. Are you open to seeing adults that are thought to have DSRD? Absolutely. Okay. After treatment is administered and <clears throat> the patient returns to baseline, is there a protocol for ongoing therapy to prevent reoccurrence? Does reoccurrence happen? So I think, one, that's all still being looked at um, because I don't think anybody gathered the information in such a uniformed way. Um, just until the last year and a half or two years. We are learning that inflammation plays a key role, and we talk about inflammation from infections, um, but we know that even dramatic emotional stressors cause an inflammatory response in the brain. Um, and so why some individuals have DSRD develop after, say, a sibling leaves for college or they leave school and now are at home with a dramatic shift in routine. Um, we, we know that there's neuroinflammation going on and most of us can handle it and manage it. Um, but in Downs or in some of these other autoimmune encephalitides, the immune system is overreactive and then causing these problems. We don't know if just treating them for six to nine months does the job and whether we're going to have to do this again because they're going to relapse. Um, it sounds like for Dr. Santoro's group so far, when he looks at the numbers, there is a small percentage that seem to relapse. And they are looking at whether there is something better than just IVIG, which is an infusion. You have to come in to an infusion center. You have to get a large IV put in. You have to get lab work. You have to waste your day there and, and um, get this IV therapy, which is a blood product. Um, and so they are absolutely actively looking to see if there are other immunomodulators we can give safely. 
Um, and so I suspect that's going to change over the coming year or two as to what our response is going to be for those who've relapsed. The ones we've treated so far, um, excluding this little four-year-old who is a unique case, um, we have not had anybody relapse. Wow. wow. Yeah. Oh, it's been, you know, it's one of the saddest things when not only could we not figure out what was going on, but then watching these beautiful young adults and adults just not be themselves, just become a shell of themselves. And, you know, anything, we would do anything to be able to help. So the fact that this has done something is just so heartening. It is so wonderful. Um, and, um, you know, we love seeing 90, 95% back to baseline, but we'll, you know, when we had absolutely nothing to give, we'll even take 50% at this point. So, um, yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Parikh and Dr. Sifferbeen and Dr. Wong, are you ready for questions? Are you, yeah? If people want to put their questions in the chat or raise their hand, they can do that. You have a hand reaction on Zoom. Debbie, there was Kristen Barrett put in the chat that they're actually in the trial in Colorado. I okay. wonder if Kristen might um, tell us a little bit about that to start off the question sessions. That'd be great. Kristen, you want to share? Hi. 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 I'm, I'm trying to get there. I'm in Florida. We've got a lot of stuff going on down here. Oh, yeah. Wow. We, we hope your family, you and your family are okay with the, the hurricane. We are good. We are in Northwest Florida. So we are, oh, allow. see if that's going to work. Hey, can you see me? 